I've just read Jordan Peterson's new book, Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life. The sequel to his 2018 bestseller, The 12 Rules of Life, An Antidote to Chaos. And like the original book, while the rules in general aren't terrible codes to live your life by, the justifications for doing so are sometimes... not right. This video is about one of them, where what he says is just utterly, totally, laughably naive. Don't worry, I'm not just some angry liberal trying to cancel Dr. Peterson because he hurt my feelings. I'll show you the math to prove he's wrong, as well as create an analogy to really drive in just how crazy his claim is. His first rule is, do not carelessly denigrate social institutions or creative achievement. Most of this chapter is devoted to the importance of maintaining social relationships, professional, familial, romantic, and platonic. Peterson is a famously controversial figure, but most of the knowledge he drops in this section is readily accepted as gospel in a scientific community. Humans are social creatures. There are benefits to forming strong bonds between one another. If the pandemic quarantine has taught us anything, it's that social isolation sucks. It's terrible for our physical, emotional, and mental well-being. The presence of a society like ours, built around our much-needed communication and relationships, means that an inevitable hierarchy is going to be created. Nothing too groundbreaking here. He talks about the experience of being at the very top of the social hierarchy. Being the top dog. Lots of people want to be the one in charge, but few actually have the proper temperament for that position. Peterson makes an important distinction between the righteous ambitious and the power hungry. When the righteous ambitious wields power, they do so because of their competence. A competence that is spontaneously recognized and appreciated by others, and generally followed willingly, with a certain relief. It's the unspoken truth of humanity that you crave subjugation. You were made to be ruled. In the end, you will always kneel. Contrast that to the power hungry who seek control over others to satisfy their base desires. You can probably already tell where JP is going with this. We want more people who are ambitious for the right reasons of helping others, and less people who are just tyrannical and looking to satisfy their hedonistic cravings. But he makes an unusual argument here, stating, The increasingly reflexive identification of the striving boys and men for victory with the patriarchal tyranny that hypothetically characterizes our modern productive and comparatively free societies is so stunningly counterproductive. And that it's also cruel since there is almost nothing worse than treating someone striving for competence as a tyrant in training. In simpler words, what Peterson is saying is that society demonizes ambition out of fear that it's a form of toxic masculinity and will lead to abuses of power. That most of the ambitious individuals are ambitious for the right reasons. They're the righteous ambitious type who genuinely want to help others. And not the tyrant who will abuse his power towards those underneath him. I do agree with Peterson in that there are definitely a plethora of people who are ambitious because they want to help other people. They want to start a nonprofit to save endangered wildlife, or finance a soup kitchen to feed the homeless. But to just throw out a blanket statement of demonizing ambition is wrong because most people are ambitious to help other people is awfully naive and ignores the fact that there are a lot of shitheads in positions of power purely because they like being a shithead. We all know ambitious people who want power for the wrong reasons. From the local bully who joins a police force, to the psychopathic Fortune 500 CEO and chairman underpaying his employees and forcing them to pee in water bottles. What's more, he contradicts himself in the same page, saying genuine authority constrains the arbitrary exercise of power. Basically, Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. Which is obviously true. How could it not be if Uncle Ben says it in every single goddamn Spider-Man reboot? But then he follows it up with a statement on how, although the good authoritative figure is going to care about the people depending on him, there are many who never hit that mentality. He forgets his origins and come to develop a counterproductive contempt for the person just starting out. Peterson goes on to describe how arrogance bars a path to learning, but that although selfish tyrants certainly exist, 
they are by no means in the majority. And what's his evidence for this claim? If they were, then according to Jordan Peterson, nothing would work. That's it. That's literally all of the evidence he provides for the claim that most powerful people have big hearts and wield their authority benevolently. But while that's technically true, it's also incredibly misleading. Only 1% of the global population meets the clinical criteria for psychopathy. But a famous 2010 study found that more than 3.9% of bosses are psychopaths. Full stop. 4.4% have psychopathic tendencies, but aren't quite fully blown psychopaths. Granted, 3.9% and 4.4% of the workforce is still a minority. But it isn't indicative of our society's prowess in shutting down immorality that less than 51% of the sample group does exhibit the psychopathic tendencies only 1% of the entire population has to begin with. Which is a point Jordan Peterson is trying to make here. To help illustrate why, let's consider this. Suppose 1% of apples have a genetic anomaly that makes them not contain any seeds. Like this one, for example. If I go to a random stretch of land in California and pick 100 apples from 100 different trees and find that four of those apples don't have any seeds, then does that mean that the soil in this particular region is conductive to growing apples with seeds because there are more apples with seeds than apples without? Or does it suggest the opposite? That there's some property in this block of land that encourages seedless apple growth since it contains four times the amount of seedless apples than it should statistically have. Then we replace the 1% of apples being seedless with the statistic of 1% of the general population being psychopaths. And a stretch of Californian land with the corporate environment. So miss me what the society doesn't reward tyrannical behaviors with positions of power bullshit. Because while it is technically true that the majority of powerful people aren't psychopathic, the fact that being a psychopath gives you a 4x chance of reaching a position of power is very much a problem. If Peterson was right in saying that the corporate environment actively discourages psychopathic and tyrannical behavior, then less than 1% of the managers would be psychopathic. That's literally just mathematical probability. I'm not just saying that neither. I literally did the math to prove this. The probability of 3.9% of managers being psychopathic when only 1% of the population has a trait can be described with this formula. This is the equation for finding probabilities within a sample proportion. z equals p hat minus mu of p over the standard deviation. The standard deviation is the square root of p multiplied by 1 minus p divided by n. Note that p hat is a sample proportion that we're measuring. p is a population proportion, the proportion of the entire population at large, and not just the sample that we're measuring. And n is a sample size. Plugging in the values, we're using p hat equals 0 0.03899 because we're looking for the probability of the sample being just over 0 0.03899, which is 0 0.039. p is 0 0.01 because just 1% of the whole population is psychopathic. n is 100 because that's the sample size that we're using of 100 managers. Solving the equation, we get z is equal to 0 0.02899 divided by 0 0.0099, or z is equal to 2.928. If we match up the z value of 2.928 with the probability chart, we can find that the probability of managers being a literal psychopath just by a whim of fate and that because a late capitalistic environment rewards toxic behavior is 0.17%. The interpretation of this chart may be confusing to people who have never seen this before, 
So I'll explain it really quickly. The vertical column is the first two digits of the number. The horizontal rows are the third and fourth digits. You match up the rows and columns to see the probability of the sample being under the general population. Keep in mind that this is only a sample size of 100 people. The Bureau of Labor released a report stating that there were 24 million managers in the year 2014. Increasing the sample size increases the chance that the modern work environment endorses this kind of abusive behavior. This is something called the law of large numbers. A theory and probability that states that the larger the sample size is, the less likely there will be any deviations. So, since the real-world probability of someone being a psychopath is only 1%, the law of large numbers states that as more corporate bosses are sampled, the number of psychopathic bosses should get closer and closer to 1%, not increase to 3.9%. What's more, 3.9% of the managerial workforce being a psychopathic is the absolute most conservative number I can find. There are more liberal estimates, suggesting that it's up to 20%. And on top of all of that, this 3.9% number is for pure, unadulterated psychopathy. The study didn't find that 3.9% of bosses display some psychopathic behaviors that make them toxic bosses. It found that 3.9% of bosses are hardcore psychopaths. Psychopathic behaviors would be the ones found in the 4.4% of bosses. You already know how the math works, so I won't bore you with the calculations, but it comes out to a z-score of 3.42, which translates to a 0.0003% chance that the modern-day working environment doesn't advocate psychopathic behaviors. So while it's technically not impossible that Jordan Peterson is right on the subject matter, the math literally says that there's a 99.99969% chance that he's wrong on an epic proportion. Just for fun, I wanted to see what the probabilities of 10% of managers having psychopathic tendencies would be, 10% being the statistic found in a 2011 Australian study of white collar managers. And I know, I know, this new study was done in Australia, a totally different country from the United States. Maybe the Aussies have to kill their sense of empathy in order to survive the harsh than the outback. I don't know. Anyway, this C value is 9.081. With the probability chart, we can find that the probability of 10% of managers being psychopathic on some whimsical whim of fate and that because a corporate environment actively encourages this exact type of behavior is... too improbable to be considered a viable option by mathematicians. See? The chart doesn't even go above a z-value of 4. For reference, a z-value of 1.65 is a 90% confidence level in accuracy, and a z-value of 2.58 is a 99% confidence level in accuracy. So, Given this pattern, I think you can see what a z-value of more than 9 means in terms of probability. Since mathematicians decided that a z-score of 9.081 wasn't worth making a table about due to how astronomically low of a probability it had of occurring, we have to use a specialized calculator for this. I went to calculator.net, plugged in the values of 0.09999 for x because we are looking for the probability of more than 9.999% of managers being psychopathic. Mu is 0.01 because that's a real probability of any random person being pulled of being a literal psychopath. The standard deviation is a bit that was in the square roots earlier. That's still 0.0099. So what happens when you replace a completely hardcore psychopath with just 10% of those with psychopathic tendencies? It shows that the probability of 10% of white collar managers will be toxic for some reason other than the corporate environment encourages exploitation is 0%. Literally 0%. Not 0.0001%. Just flat out 0%. Basically, what I'm trying to say is, Dr. Peterson, you really dropped the ball on this one.